So, um, how are you doing today? I'm good. I've um, not gotten a lot of sleep this week, so I'm a bit tired. But other than that, everything is going well. No, oh, why? Why not? Why not so much sleep? You know, I just I have early morning classes this semester, and I'm never I'm just not a morning person. So even when I try to fall asleep early, I don't, and I just just end up being tired and kind of sluggish for the semester. I know, which yeah, I just I just actually took a nap. I got I had to get up at least before before eight, at least four times this week, which is crazy. Yeah, that's rough yeah. for us artists. I don't know how people do it. I don't know either. I mean, it's, I guess some people just gravitate towards the morning and some people gravitate towards the evening. And I hear that if you're one way, it's really hard to change yourself. Yeah. So ideally, you know, when your work schedule can match up with your body rhythms, that's the best. Do you know if Lady Gaga has a song about that? About sleep? About, well, whether you're a night person or a day person and how you can't really change that. No, she doesn't, but she does have a song called Dance in the Dark. Oh. <laughs> so maybe she's a night person. <laughs> I think she's a jet lag person, actually, because she's always touring. <laughs> yeah. I always wonder how, like, people do that, like politicians and Lady Gaga, because they always look pretty well rested, but they're constantly traveling. I have no idea. I mean, I think they probably take drugs, like yeah. prescription sleeping medication. Uh, but I don't know. I couldn't handle it. Yeah. That would be intense. I'm, there must be a book. I bet there's strategy. There must be some kind of book. Some help, <laughs> some help book for how to, like, cross date lines and into different... Well, I do things. know you're supposed to do things like when you get there, you're not supposed to go to sleep. Um, right. If you're tired and drink water and go out in the daylight and all of that sort of thing, but right. probably just depends on how sensitive you are to some people are like machines. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not like a machine. No, you're like a guru. Oh. <laughs> well, um. Oh wait, what's that? Oh, I just said I'm not a machine either. Yeah. Well, I never thought you were. I kind of look like one right now, but I'm not. But those glasses are incredible. I want to, I hope your students can see them on the... Well, I, I kind of like it because, like, okay, so when they're down, mm -hmm. so would you say that's Jesus on there? Yeah. And then when you kind of lift them up a little bit, well, a little bit down, then right, a little bit more, a little bit more down, oh, right there, oh, wait, a little bit up. So it goes from Jesus to... A picture of me. <laughs> cool. Yeah. But that makes perfect sense. We've always thought you were Jesus anyway. Oh. <laughs> Jesus is waving at the audience. <laughs> awesome. Well, anyways. <laughs> well, um, thanks for um, meeting up with me and my class. And oh, I'm sorry yeah. we weren't able to meet with you last week, but um, what I've done is uh, my Otis uh, class, which is called uh, Art, um, Education, and Activism in the Digital Age, we're doing a bunch of interviews with different artists and kind of collecting our documentation and putting it on our blog. And, um, and so we're really excited about your work, and I had them generate a bunch of questions, um, and I thought I might just ask you some of their questions randomly. Do. Yeah? Okay, so I went to, I wrote them all down and I went to random.org and, and organized them. So. Oh, cool. The first question is from Mike Connolly and it's What is a mall witch? What? <laughs> That's funny because mall witch. Is my friend's project, not mine. Oh. So there's a poet, a New York poet, Ben Fama, who wrote a book called Mall Witch, and it's going to be coming out actually in a couple months. 
It's in a magazine format, and it is inspired by the internet. Mm -hmm. I'm on the cover of it. Oh. And there's some poems about me and other pictures of me in there. So I guess I am a mall witch. Yeah. Wait, so does the title say mall witch up at the top, and then it has a picture of you? Yeah. Oh. But, I mean, that's only because I've been dubbed one by someone else, so I didn't think of that term oh. or anything like that. But I think a mall witch is like... Um, like the craft meets clueless. Uh huh. Like a goth '90s witch. Um, Farouzabalk meets Alicia Silverstone at the mall, yeah. and is fused in one person. That That's sounds. My that sounds exciting. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think you're a mall witch. That sounds. That sounds like you. Thanks. Right. For both worlds. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> okay. Or I wouldn't be on the cover. Yeah. Well, you know, maybe it can be kind of like, you know, Barack got the uh, the Nobel Prize a few years ago and probably didn't really deserve it. So he said that, you know, it was something to work towards. It wasn't about <laughs> the past, it was about the future. So maybe you can continue. You know. I, like, I like that idea. Yes. I will strive toward earning yeah. my mall witch cred. Yeah, I think maybe may, may, maybe just need to get your Mulwich MFA at this point or PhD, so. advanced you, degree. Yeah, you can get that at Claire's, I think, or <laughs> um, the icing. <laughs> Hot topic. <laughs> Excellent. Um, well, so one of our students, Daniel French, wants to know if you have a he wants to know about your performance work and whether you have a primary mission or two for your performance work. You can interpret that however you'd like. Primary mission. That's a good question. I tend to think of the projects sort of individually, as I think a lot of artists do. But if I look back on them, there is a lot of um, continuity. There's usually the subjects are women. Um, usually I'm dealing with pop culture in some way. It's usually sort of a feminist bent, although I would call it digital age feminism. Mm -hmm. um, I guess a mission could be just sometimes it's to draw attention to something that I feel like has been either overlooked or not given serious attention either in the larger culture or by the art world. Uh -huh. um, so, for example, you know, the pile of panties, <laughs> when I piled the panties on Sunset Boulevard. Yeah, what was that, yeah, what was that all? What, what, uh, can you describe what, what, that was, what was happening? Yes, so for that project, last year I had a bunch of women email me their dirty underwear, which I handled with gloves, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I went down to Sunset Boulevard because this was for uh, the Los Angeles Road Concert. So these were a series of performances curated by Steven Van Dyke mm -hmm. um, all along Sunset Boulevard. So a lot of different performance artists were doing work that day. So mm -hmm. I picked the location near a women's shelter. Um, and then I just piled the underwear on the street. And I, I was in underwear myself, which was probably the riskiest part of this. I didn't know what to do. The guys at AutoZone across the street just sat on the curb and watched me for like multiple hours. They were very <laughs> amused and intrigued. But um, <laughs> I, I wanted to see what people would do with the pile. I wanted to see if they would pay attention to it or ignore it, take the panties. And um, what was interesting was that a lot of people ignored it. They just barely mm -hmm. even looked at it as they walked past. And I know this is L.A., so we're used to seeing any number of things on the street here. Yeah, I see <laughs> underwear all over the place. It was a, still a very disturbing sort of monument. So to have people ignore it, I think, spoke to some of the larger cultural issues that the pile of panties could represent, having to do with discarded women or even just, you know, yeah. scarlets in L.A. sort of been washed up, like Lindsay Lohan or... Whatever, that someone could so easily walk past something like that and be like, eh, whatever. And then right. some lady came along and she 
like stole half the pile. She put it oh. in her purse. Oh wait, who is this? Just some. A lady, yeah. <laughs> she was wearing the exact opposite outfit of, as mine. It was except she wasn't in her underwear, but everything else looked just like me, except in black, and I was in light colors, and it was very strange. Oh wow. Yeah. And there's there's video of this, isn't there, online? Yes, on look. YouTube. And you can Google the pile of panties and Kate Durbin, and there is evidence of the panty theft. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah, I remember watching the uh, video of that afterwards. I didn't get to witness it in person from AutoZone, but <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, the video that I saw was fantastic, and um and. Uh, and part of it was, uh, I mean, one of the things that was really fantastic about the video, like obviously there was the performance or the, the whatever that happened, and you know, mo most people who were looking for it um, may have discovered the panties, and it was just, you know, you you might not have been around, when, or they might not have noticed you or something, and it would have been them kind of relating to the panties. But the great thing about the video is that you're shooting the video, and and you're like it, it's like s extremely voyeuristic we get to hear your commentary <laughs> yeah Watch. yeah it was very strange i i really didn't know what was going to happen i mean that's the thing about performance especially live performance or street performance it's so like i shouldn't say dangerous but it's just so uncontrolled in so many ways so yeah and it's very much like a science experiment what's going to go down on the corner of sunset with this pile of panties today. Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it, yeah, things could go really wrong or really right really quickly. <laughs> and they that. did both. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think, you know, that performance speaks to, if I were to have a mission, um, that sort of impetus to see if people will pay attention to something or draw their attention to something that I think is neglected, but do it in a way that's artistic and, um, you know, just gives people an opportunity maybe to pay attention. It doesn't uh -huh. necessarily force them to do it. Yeah. So, that, that's super. Here's um, another question from Andy Chow. Um... Well, this maybe actually even re uh, relates a maybe a little bit to that example, but it, feel free to expand upon it in a different direction. He says, I love how you said, to me, to be a woman, an artist, and to be free, the bitch has to trust herself, has to trust her art. And then he says, give me an example of a risk you took in your work. Hmm. I'm like trying to think of one I didn't take now. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds vain or something, but I mean, obviously that was a good example that mm -hmm. it was a little bit physically risky to run around sunset on my in my underwear. Um, what else? Do you feel like there's a sim like a what about risk on on the internet, for instance? Um, have you taken risks on the internet? Yeah, the internet's a good way to look at that. Um, well, I think with both my project Gaga Stigmata, which is an online journal about Lady Gaga that's going to be a book, and then this other project I have on Tumblr called Women as Objects, where I retumble um, the blog posts of teenage girls. I feel like with both of those projects, I took a very specific type of risk, which is that neither of those, like Lady Gaga, especially at the time several years ago when I started that project, people were not taking her seriously as um, an artist. Mm -hmm. So for me to come out and say, okay, I'm taking what she's doing seriously, I think she's going to keep doing really important work over the course of, you know, the next several years, and I'm going to start this whole journal with this idea that we're going to write pop cultural criticism about what she's doing um, as fast as she does it, and we're going to be able to interact with her and maybe even change the shape of her project throughout mm -hmm. the course of our project. Um, that was pretty risky because I didn't know if people would just laugh at me or think yeah. that I was, I didn't know if it would work, and honestly it could mm -hmm. have not worked. Um, but it did. Yeah. 
so that was one risk. And then with the Tumblr project, just again, it's, you know, people don't necessarily see teenagers as these brilliant culture makers, even though they are. Um, and pe a lot of people, maybe in the art world or whatever, don't even know what Tumblr is. Now they mm -hmm. have started to, but um, to make work in a medium like that that's not in the gallery or can't easily sort of be, um, I don't know, shopped around for grants or whatever. Right, um, right. It's kind of risky because I have to depend on people on the internet being interested in following it and um, mm -hmm. and it could easily fail. Yeah. No, that's interesting because that's like there's a, a in identifying these risks there are a bunch of different you know like with the with the panty pile you know the risk was like you know the you know well like you're in your underwear or, you know like <laughs> some weird some weirdo gonna come over or a police officer you know there's like you know the 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 public yeah and then but for this interesting like with the Gaga stigmata like the risk was specifically with your I mean with in a sense your art community. Mm -hmm. And the and you know whether that would mark, you know, a possible end to opportunities within your community yeah. or a you know a certain like kind of, I, I've definitely felt that sort of sense of like oh am I gonna like be banished from my community or not being taken <laughs> seriously because of this this thing that I'm about to do. Um, yeah, and it's, it's kind of terrifying because I, I feel like those are the only projects I'm ever interested in and so sometimes to be honest I'm surprised that I'm included in the community at all like I think it speaks <laughs> to the community's like open-mindedness that you know people just have given me the benefit of the doubt yeah well you make fantastic work so well thank you um, cool um, let's see another question and you just let me know when you're tired of answering questions and we'll, we don't have to go through all of them. I'll just projectile vomit on the screen. Right? Oh, that would be fantastic. <laughs> and we'll just fade to black. Okay. <laughs> um, so this question is for, from Fernanda Lariva. question is, what do you think of Lady Gaga's little monsters? Um, and do you think of them as followers of Lady Gaga? What do you think about them being so obsessed with Lady Gaga? <laughs> I don't know why that question makes me laugh. Um, well, I think I am a little monster, so... Mm -hmm. Except I don't like... I've never liked that they were called little right. monsters. Except quite recently she said something like, they're not little monsters anymore. You have to grow up sometime. So uh -huh. <laughs> she addressed my problem of not wanting to be little. Um, Have you actually written about that? Or has anybody written about the, the diminutive... Little monsters on Gaga Stigmata? No. Okay. No, I don't think anyone has. I think I mentioned it in an interview once, press interview, but um Well I do think of them as sort of a community on to themselves that revolves around Lady Gaga but is sort of a culture movement. Mm -hmm. And I wish somebody would make a documentary on Little Monsters because I think it would be really fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, they are often, you know, sort of the misfits and freaks of society and they've all sort of bonded together um, over her music and what she stands for. But what's interesting is, of course, she's so huge. It's not like, you know, I mean, she's a big pop star. It's not like she's a, sort of a cult figure or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously I share their obsession, so I can't judge the little monsters, but I would say, you know, any type of over-obsession with anything can be, yeah, can be bad for, no matter what it is, it could be cheese, <laughs> string cheese. <laughs> yeah, I used to, I used to be a little monster for string cheese. See? And these days yeah. it's for, for coconut water. Got At least the last three or four days. Can't get enough. Well, oh. you'll be ready for your desert island <laughs> adventure when you get stranded. Yeah, well, I might be a little over it by then, but I guess I'll have to I'll be ready. <laughs> one, one other question, though, about Little Monsters. I, I have a, I'm, not, I'm not actually that familiar with Little Monsters, but I am familiar with the, uh, like, for instance, the Juggalos, right, who were, um, who were kind of 
it sounds like a pretty uh, had a similar situation with like the insane clown posse. Oh, okay. And and they actually call yeah. it like a religion, and they're you know, and they have certain identifying features like, you know, kind of like clown painting, and uh, and then online there's lots of like mis you know misspelled kind of like text message kind of word, you know, it's like a and and a certain kind of slang. Is there a certain? Oh, cool. Is there a similar kind of like? Um, aesthetic or fashion to being a a, a, a little monster? Like, can oh, you yeah. pick one well, out this of the is, crowd? I can show you the define. like, this is how you show that you're a little monster. It's kind of like showing that you're a Trekkie. You mm -hmm. make um, the monster claw like this. Uh-huh. So if you see another little monster and you do that, then you guys have identified each other. And this uh, is from the Bad Romance video when Lady Gaga comes out of the... Oh, wow. The latex coffin, and she puts you know, pot. You know what's so hilarious is, uh, is just literally just a week ago, someone was telling me that their friend, like to discipline their dog, mm -hmm. like if the dog is like uh, freaking out or doing something that they shouldn't be, they don't like, you know, spank it or grab its snout or anything like that. They go, they just look at the dog and they go, oh my god. And the dog responds to that, and maybe the dog's a little monster. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> the dog's just trying to sing along, sing Lady Gaga okay. lyrics. All well, there are definitely some other defining attributes too. I mean, a lot of their fashion is very similar to hers. Right. Um, so they, you know, look like little mini Lady Gagas. Uh huh. Well, that's interesting because, like, when I think of Lady Gaga in fashion, I feel like. Uh, I feel like I'm not going to recognize her the next time I see her because it's always like the thing that is consistent is the almost inconsistency of her fashion. Um, yeah, I mean, she does have some defining uh -huh. sort of um, styles. Like she always wears the huge shoes with no heel, mm -hmm. um, the sort of like Marilyn Manson shoes. Right. Uh, wears a lot of black, like bondage type mm -hmm. clothing. But yes, they definitely, I mean, the Little Monsters have such a vast sort of um, library of knowledge of her different looks, and so they'll, you know, pick and choose different eras at will. She also has created her own online community, so it's like Facebook for Little Monsters. It's called littlemonsters.com, and she's mm -hmm. the first pop artist to do this. And so all the Little Monsters gather on there, and they'll chat with each other. They call her Mother Monster. Um, they'll draw, you know, fan pictures of her that sometimes she'll get ideas from for outfits or, you know, her next concept or whatever. So yeah. I would say the defining attribute of Little Monsters is really their synergy with Lady Gaga. It's kind of unique. Like, she is in contact with them 24-7, and she does take ideas from them. Recently, she took one, one of them was doing all these beautiful drawings she loves, so she indoctrinated that person into what's called the House of Gaga, and that's her team of creative people. Oh, so wow. She was like the first little monster. To, and I don't think that person's actually going to be working for her or anything. I think it was just kind of an honorary, like, right. shout-out type thing. But um, it's a good example of how she and her monsters operate differently. Wow. Other fan groups. I bet that would be so incredible to put on your resume. <laughs> yeah. Little monster... 20, 2012 to present. I know. Well, that attitude that she has is why I thought the journal would work because, you know, she has tweeted a, an article that my co-editor wrote and then two people from her team have tweeted different things that we've written about their work and her. Um, so we know that they're reading what we do mm -hmm. and responding to it, which is pretty cool. If it was Beyonce or something, we just wouldn't be able to touch her. She's untouchable. Let's see. So, what another question? Um, Mike uh, Connolly uh, has a question about a recent video of yours. That, um, he says, "Who are the two characters in the Tumblr? Is the only place I don't pretend I'm okay." Video, and maybe you could just tell us what that video uh, a little bit about the video for a second, then. Sure. I like that question because people keep asking me it, and I think I need to come up with a, a good answer. But um, <laughs> that video, what I did was I took a bunch of text posts from Tumblr, and if you know Tumblr at all, you know that 
like people on Tumblr, and in this case, teenage girls, I was only following teenage girls, will write posts, you know, just whatever's on their mind. It's kind of like Facebook status updates, but a little bit more artful, sometimes longer, more poetic at times, other times not. Mm -hmm. um, usually more, I don't know, a little more risque, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, so I took their text posts, and then sometimes they would have conversations with each other, too, asking each other questions, advice, um, or just giving compliments or whatever. Um, and so I took all of that, and I made a dialogue between two Tumblr girls. So, and they were in two different water settings, because I was referencing sea punk, which started, I didn't start slowly on the internet, but that was sort of the internet and Tumblr, what made sea punk really take off. Uh -huh. um, and I also sort of see Tumblr like water, or like a moving stream, because it's always moving. Oh, wow. Oh, right. That makes sense. Yeah, so I had the two girls in dialogue. So I don't have names for them or anything like that, but I really was just trying to embody Tumblr girls. And I was also thinking when I, you know, I wore this, like, strange turban and I wore stickers on my face and, you know, my Lime Crime lipstick, like this one. Mm -hmm. um, I was just thinking of the way that they adorn themselves and their pictures on Tumblr. And also I was thinking about the way that they... Um, play with their pictures in Photoshop, but I wanted to do that without any Photoshop or any, like, I didn't want to make it into a GIF or add anything digitally to it, so mm -hmm. I wanted to take everything that was on the internet and make it, just, like, try to do it literally in my bathroom, because I thought it would be funny and also just right. interesting, so that's why I have, like, you know, stickers, real stickers on my face as opposed to, like, a sticker that I made float on the screen or something like that. Um, when you when you made that video, did you um, post a link to it on your uh, on Tumblr? And do you know if any and if so, do you know if any of those uh, any of the subjects that you whose Tumblr pages you sampled, whether they saw it? I don't you know, I should have contacted them directly, but I did post it, but it's really hard to get people to watch videos on Tumblr. It's more yeah. of a visual, like they want a picture, or maybe a text post, but mm -hmm. um, so I don't think anyone from Tumblr saw it. Um, I could always try to put it out there again, but yeah, it would be funny. To <laughs> I yeah. don't know if people like it or not. It yeah. I wonder if Tumblr will make people like uh, will c will continue the decline of people's taste for experimental art videos because it seems like even before Tumblr, <laughs> um, especially with uh, students of mine, not not at Otis but um, at other places um, who haven't really experienced video art, um, you know that one of the main um, or experimental film, one of the main complaints is duration. Um, mm. That you know, like oh man, this is so boring. Like get to the point, like or what else, you know and. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of a lot of talking about um, duration and the editing, and uh, and it's interesting. So, I mean, you you're kind of you're you're kind of a Tumblr expert at this point, and you really know how at least this commu this one community of girls yeah, probably true. deal with what what they are and aren't looking at, maybe mm -hmm. based on the likes and stuff. But um, um, I mean, I guess it's interesting that you you know then made the video. So in a, in a way, is it kind of like, I mean, it's funny you talk about what, like the Tumblr, like water. So do you feel like, uh, I mean, do you feel like the folks that you're tumbling with are, I mean, are those your, are those your friends or is it more like these are like, this is like fish, you're going fishing and then when you get a catch, you're going to bring it back to your art community and kind of have a dinner and share with like, like what, how do you relate to That's that community? That's a good question. And I don't, I don't know because I don't feel like the art community gets it, mm -hmm. to be honest. They don't know what Tumblr is. A lot of them, you know, especially if they're older or whatever. Um, and I think the, some of the girls on Tumblr have checked out the project itself and written to me like, I'm so excited, this is so interesting. Or they're like confused for a minute and then when I explain it to them, it's actually pretty simple. I'm like, I'm just reblogging what you're doing because I think it's really exciting and changing pop culture and then they're like, oh, wow, I'm so excited and they want to send me all their art or whatever. <laughs> um, 
it's cute, but they like it. And but I would say the people who love it the most are just like the few people I know in the art community who know what Tumblr is and think it's interesting and then they love it. They're like, this is brilliant. This is so interesting. But it's such a small audience that um you know, it, it may may actually, oddly, even though it has to do with something so immediate, a video like that might be more relevant, you know, as the years pass and Tumblr is either more part of the, you know, more people know what it is or it fades into obscurity or something. Yeah. Well, who's to, you know, who who knows if it just disappears and turns into something else, you know, those those services tend to go away, although we see with ones like Facebook, it's, you know, it's actually been around for quite some time now, and, but, um, yeah. I don't know, it, I mean, I definitely didn't even know what Tumblr was a year ago, and then, uh, it seems like I, I, I'm starting to notice a lot of my art, art friends getting more and more interested in it and involved, so yeah, I think it would be interesting to see, you know, to, you know, to, to check in about all of that, you know, a year from now, even, so. Yeah, I think so. And I think, I mean, the video is, in and of itself, it's a strange kind of interesting, like, even if I didn't know what Tumblr was, I, I would still have a lot of strange emotions in relationship. I don't know if you've watched it, these girls interacting, but mm -hmm. it's, um, I think it still kind of works even if you don't know what Tumblr is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, bizarre. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I wanted to say something about duration, though, because oh, yeah, duration. what's interesting is, yes, like, attention spans are much shorter, but there's the, you know, there's this girl on Tumblr, Molly Soda, she's, like, Tumblr famous. <laughs> they call it. <laughs> what's her name again? Her name's Molly Soda, and uh -huh. she makes these videos on Tumblr. I mean, she was one of my inspirations for being interested in Tumblr. Like, I would love to do more work with Molly. Um, mm -hmm. she'll make two hour long videos where she answers people's questions mm -hmm. for two hours straight from her ask box. Oh, and wow. Like, I mean, talk about something that's long and boring. I mean, so much of what these kids do is kind of boring yeah. and very, very long and tedious, right. like right. all of the art that we love. Um, so... You know, I think it's just about if you're sort of well-known or intriguing enough for them to want to watch for two hours, they will. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I think, I mean, Tumblr, I mean, it kind of what you're kind of describing there is like using Tumblr as a producer or, you know, like, and, or, you know, like a, you know, like a recycler. Um you know, you're either producing content and posting it, or you're finding content and reposting it. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it's interesting the divide between that. You know, there's that side of it, which is that could be that. I mean, which to me honestly is kind of boring because like I have, I'm busy and I have things to do. And <laughs> but like on the other side of it, just being a viewer and just like scrolling and you know, page down, page down, page down. It's so. Um, Yes, yeah, so it's like so dynamic and so fast and so fleeting. And, yeah. Um, but yeah, I never thought. Yeah, of course. Like, there are people putting in a lot of work on the other side. Oh, yeah. A lot of labor is involved. Yeah. Um, totally. Um, well, here's an interesting question, kind of going in another direction from um, Andy Chow again. It says, um, um, th "So they're aware that you uh, you also teach." And they want. Uh, he wants to know what subject do you teach, and in what ways have teaching affected your work, or do you think it takes a, takes you away from your work? Mm, good question. Now, it's worth now it's worth noting that this class is uh, it's a class at Otis, and it's situated. It's an elective, I think. Well, it might be required. It's in, within a program where students can get a, like a an edu a minor in education. So it's they're artists, but they're interested in education. So that's where that questions kind of comes from. Cool. That's actually sounds like a good program. Um, okay, so what do I teach? Well, my favorite thing to teach is a class I'm teaching right now at Whittier College. Um, it's a writing course, but I get to pick a theme, and so the theme I almost always pick is monsters. Speaking mm -hmm. of little monsters, but little monsters aren't my theme. Right. 
big monsters are. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I love teaching that class. Um, we read Dracula, Frankenstein, um, sometimes we read Stephen King, watch Cabin in the Woods. Oh, wow. Um, and then we sort of analyze the monsters and try to dissect which cultural fears and desires the individual monsters sort of carry for us. Um, uh -huh. Which I think, you know, there's a parallel with that and all of the work I do because I'm always examining culture and trying to sort of dig underneath the surface of things, especially if I'm doing work with pop culture or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, do I feel like it takes me away? You know, I, I only do when I have to teach so much that I don't have time to make art or I'm just feeling burnt out. But if I'm if I have a balanced schedule, and I know Adam, you know this is a <laughs> feeling. <laughs> um, if I have a nice balanced schedule, then no, it doesn't. It doesn't take me away. I feel I'm a pretty generally inspired person, so there's you know always energy for both. If you know I have enough time to sleep and eat and see my friends and stuff, which I honestly don't a lot of the times. Teaching is not high-paying work, so I think if you're an artist and you want a lot of time to make art, you should do something else, like do someone's taxes or something, or like, oh, wow. it sounds terrible, but you can do it like really intensely for like three months a year, and then you have like nine months to make art. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. I always thought that if you were doing like taxes and stuff, it was like year-round, and then you were just kind of miserable, like, nine to five all year round or something. Or maybe... No, because it's just during tax season. Most people want to get their taxes done. Wow. That sounds amazing. I didn't realize that. See, I, had thought, I, I thought I had it good as a teacher. <laughs> well, you I don't. Could, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't think... I mean, I love teaching. That's why I do it. But I don't think it's that good of a gig if you're not doing it full-time in terms of trying to make art and teach, because you have to teach so many classes that you're teaching, you're working like more than full time, at least that's how it's been for me. Yeah, yeah, it always, when, when, I ever, when, when I've talked to you about your teaching, it seems like, it seems crazy, like, and, and I know other people who are doing that too, who have, you know, are teaching like five or six classes yeah. in several places and aren't, you know, full time at any of them, and yeah, I somehow kind of skate by, I just kind of, barely skate by with a handful of classes. Um, That's good. Well, I also teach writing. Yeah. So it's a lot of grading. Right. If you teach something else, you don't have to grade and as much. <laughs> yeah. grade a little bit, but, um, you know, and I've, I always take it seriously. That's maybe part of my problem. But yeah. That's, like, that's, it's very I dangerous. I do that with everything. I do with my art and with my writing. <laughs> I mean, my teaching, whatever, but. Well, it's fantastic. Do you find that the students are really get like are really interested and engaged with this idea of monsters and? Oh yeah, they love it. They love um, it. What 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 is? Usually they don't, but usually they're they're intrigued. Yeah, and it sounds like you're you know you're not just intrigued. I mean, there's lots of monster movies these days, but it sounds like you're dealing with like monster texts from a from a while ago um, that kind of define the the genre. What's what, you know, what's 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 con what do you find is consi like what's the consistent? Is it like you mentioned just uh, social? Like, is it mostly just ho highlighting social fears and anxiety for them? You know, um, well, it's a freshman course, so I try. I think it takes them a good half to three fourths of the semester to really even understand how to do that, how to take a monster, put it in its cultural context. So, say Dracula, we're working on now. He's a great one to start with because, you know, he, that novel, in addition to just being brilliantly, beautifully written, you can read it just as pure horror, it's fun, scary, but it's such a social commentary at the same time if you start mm -hmm. to apply different lenses like the psychoanalytic lens or the post-colonial lens or, you know, whatever. So Dracula really is Victorian England's monster and he... So all these fears about, you know, women's sexual freedom are so, you know, embedded in that text and um, their fear of, like, racial mixing and their desire to colonize the world. All of that is there and it's so rich. 
um, that it's a good text to start with because you can examine that culture, which people have, you know, because they've seen movies and stuff, they know a little bit about the Victorians. Um, mm -hmm. And then once they do that, they're usually more prepared to, say, analyze our culture. If we look at Twilight or something, we can start right. to analyze females in the United States now, what their desires are and um, something like that. Quick, a uh, quick question. Uh, uh, do uh, uh, do it, do any of your do you know if any of your students um, who come to your class your classes at various places do you know if any of them like know you uh, outside of just being a teacher like do they know your any of them already know your public persona or your uh, on Facebook or on Tumblr or are they already aware of some of the projects you're involved with and you know I don't. I don't think any of them know before they come to class, mm -hmm. but then they always add me on Facebook, and then, like, I, usually what I've noticed is that they will, they will like me, <laughs> but then they will add me on Facebook, and then they'll, like, love me. <laughs> They're like, wow, my teacher's wild. Um, but... No, they don't usually know. I think if I taught at a class, you know, and hopefully down the line, if I teach somewhere where it's, you know, if I taught at somewhere like CalArts or something and I was teaching very directly within my field um, and maybe upper level or something, then the students might know. But since this is college freshmen, it's a little bit different. Yeah. They don't realize who they're dealing with. <laughs> yeah. They don't know how Tumblr famous I am. <laughs> um, well, uh, maybe... I tell them, though, at the beginning of the class, I'm like, I've written these books, and I've done all this stuff, and they just smile. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting. Like, uh, you know, I know a lot of other artists who are very, um, who do a lot of weird performance stuff, Who um, and some of them are really comfortable with uh, letting their students know who they are outside of the class, and then other ones who, you know, like, so I know some people who even have a different name, uh, oh, wow. who go by a different name in, in, in class so that they're not getting Googled um, while they're in class and having, you know, nude performance art pictures sure. pulled up. And I, and I know that sort of, um, that sort of sensation. I, there were a number of years where I was very quiet about who I was in the classroom, partly because I was afraid, um, to get fired, or you know, or you know, partly because I didn't know the sub. This well, partly because I didn't really know what the subject material is. You know, yeah. like it was at a, you know a trade school where they're like, you know, you're supposed to be like a professional mm. in the field, and um, but you know, there was a certain point where I kind of felt like it was important to acknowledge who I was. You know, well, mainly that I was an artist, just so that these students who were not necessarily artists, like, could just see what a what an artist looks like to realize that they exist. Yeah. And, um, and it, but it, it, it was really, it was a weird, it felt weird. It was really like coming out of the closet and kind of acknowledging that, like, I have a whole life that, that, that exists like in the public realm. Yeah. Um, and so that, so that leads into maybe one of our last questions um, uh, that I actually wrote. So I, and I, I kind of want to know, like, you know, so you're a very public person and are involved with examining it and uh, both examining the public and private lives of celebrities and, and teenagers and kind of examining it. Um, but where in, in your life do you draw the line, if at all, in terms of what is like public and what is private? Mm, that's a good question. I feel like I'm quite private about my personal life. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny because you know, I'll post like crazy on Facebook and I now on Twitter I'll retweet all these celebrity tweets all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, you're right. I'm I'm very public in my in my work, and I'm engaged with the public twenty four seven. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't. The funny thing is, like, because my work has to deal with pop culture, and um, you know, even even um, celebrities stuff like that, it's not really about my personal life. So it's very easy for me to be right. private. Um, I think someone who does work that specifically deals with, say, like they got raped or um, something happened to them in their childhood or 
or whatever, even if it's like work that has to do with their relationship that they're in right at that moment. Like I know a lot of people do work that has to do with their narrative, their own personal narrative, uh -huh. and their own personal relationships. Um, I, I've never actually been able to stomach the thought of doing that myself. It's not interesting to me either, just on a like conceptual or intellectual level, but um, and I I like that work when other people do it, but I'm not interested in it. So I'm yeah, I managed to stay pretty private behind my Jesus shades. <laughs> <laughs> My um, my father uh, is is uh, has always been a really big music uh, uh, music freak, and I remember um, uh, when I was really little, he would always show me this cover of uh, of an album, a uh, Clash cover, and uh, I think it was Clash, and he and he showed it to me, and it was like he held it up, and it was like I think the lead singer or lead player or something had these glasses on, and he was like. Look at this guy. He's fucking amazing. He's got his glasses on, and he's like, he's not gonna let you in, you know. And it, and it was, it was like a very, um, it was a very um, interesting kind of uh, thing. Your to be dad presented. said this. Yeah, yeah. He was, he was just like, just Your in awe of this yeah. person who was so public, and then was uh, kind of, um, uh, he, he, you know, he viewed this, uh, this, this, you know, this artist's glasses as kind of a as kind of a punk, almost like a punk gesture mm -hmm. to to the viewer of like you know you can see me but I'm not letting you in or or you know or I'm not going to let you in like that deep like completely yeah. or something yeah it's but, very rock and roll totally yeah <laughs> <laughs> John Lennon did it <laughs> right okay well um one last question and then maybe we can wrap this up if, does that, that sound good. good to yeah, you yeah this has been very fun. Yeah, this has been great. I could actually go for hours, but um, duration. Why can't I say duration? <laughs> duration. Duration. Um, okay, so the last one in the uh, string of random ones I have is who is your favorite? Uh, this one's from uh, Mike Connolly. Um, who is your favorite cast member from Jersey Shore? <laughs> what a great question. Mm -hmm. Um. Oh well. If you're willing to wait for a second, I can show you. Oh, yeah. Hold on one second. It's going to be worth the wait. <laughs> Put some uh, clash on in the background, maybe. So this, you can see. Oh wait. So, is... Oh, wild. Wild cherry limited edition Snooky soda pop. Oh my gosh, is it good? It, it's wait, wild cherry. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it's good because I'm gonna keep it forever. Oh wow. Oh, so you're not gonna open it? No. Oh, we know. we used to do that with baseball cards. We would get like packs of them. And not open them. You should sell those if you have them now. Yeah, I think you can. Mhm. Mm but so so Snooky, Snooky, it is. So you're not collecting the other um, the beverages with the other characters on there, just the ones with Snooky. Well, the other characters didn't have beverages. I think that's. Oh wow. Yeah. No, I. <laughs> wow. they're, all, they're all interesting, but you know, <laughs> Snooky's the one who got punched. Whoa! Man in a bar, and uh, you mean outside? Uh, wait, I, I don't really follow that show. Did that happen in the show, or uh, yeah, it happened in the show. She was up in someone's face. This was first season, I think. Um, she was up in someone's face and in a bar, and this man, and she's like a tiny person, and this big burly man just clocked her. Wow! All over the news. Has MTV gone too far? Has reality TV gone too far? And so that was the moment. That was the wild cherry moment. Mm-hmm. Yep. Poor Snooks. <laughs> well, um, well, thanks so much, Kate, for joining us and uh, answering Thank all my fun me. students' questions. They sound um, very smart and 
fun, those students of yours. Yeah, it's a rad, it's a rad, rad time with them. So, anyways, we'll to have you. Oh, thank you. Well, we'll be we'll be having a whole Tumblr uh, section later on in the semester, and we'll be trolling trolling around your site even oh, more. Great. Um, Good. So, so stay tuned. I will. But all right. Well, I'm gonna say goodbye now to our studio audience. Unless you have anything else to add. I do not. Okay. I think Snooky said it all. Thank you, Snooky. <laughs> Bye. All right.